Cheers again. Um, you know, we loved all the events in the past. I can't wait to get going again. Lockdown's been kind of killing us. We've all lost about a year and a half now at this stage. So um, hopefully we'll see us all at an event soon. Um, okay, so generally the talk is about, um, to begin with, beginners that are looking for a scope. And obviously we've been in business 10 years now, 10 years now this year. Um, so we're well used to having various different types of customer walk through the door or phone or email looking for a telescope for various age groups and needs, um, able-bodied, disabled, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we haven't had any complaints about people coming back um, with the scope that we have recommended for them. So based on all the experience that we have in supplying scopes, um, I kind of would know how to narrow it down and kind of arrive at the scope that's best for you because the scope that's best for me is not necessarily one that's good for you or your kids or your partners or whatever the case may be. So in general, what normally happens is if you follow the customers that email or call us, usually the phone call starts with, or the email starts with, I don't know what I'm looking for. I've been searching for three months and I'm lost. And the answer for me then is, yeah, yeah, it can be quite difficult. If you go Googling and YouTube and all of that, like in anything, there's just so many different fields to astronomy that you'll get lost pretty quick. And generally, I get phone calls and emails and people drop into the shop here um, looking to kind of help them reset themselves and in an easy five-minute conversation, narrow it down to two or three telescopes um, that they could consider getting for what they need. So the first thing is, is the misconception that it's incredibly complicated. And it's very easy to narrow it down. I know like anyone that has shot for a scope or those of us that know a lot about it will know that, you know, it is fairly easy to narrow it down. But when you're coming at it from the outside, it really isn't. Um, so generally what happens is when they talk to me, they're talking about, you know, schmidt cassegrain type reflect or scopes and reflectors and refractors and such and such a friend who has telescopes recommended I get such and such a scope. And generally I just stop them in their tracks and say, how much are you spending? And then they say 300 quid. And I'm like, well, then forget about the Schmidt Cassegrains, forget about the big refractors. And you're basically just narrowing it down for them exactly as they've just said it to you. You've only got 300 quid to spend. There are 10,000 telescopes you don't need to worry about and about five that you do. Um, so that's an easy way of narrowing it down is setting your budget. So once you set the budget and that budget is taught up, usually based on the experience of the person that they're buying it from. So if they have a 10 year old in the house who has casually mentioned it like a telescope, you really don't want to spend too much. If you have a 10 or 11 year old that's been babbling on about the sky and stars and you hear the word galaxy and you hear the word star cluster, you probably want to spend a little bit more. And what you're spending the money on, aside from it obviously being the telescope, is you're future proofing yourself against having to buy another one. And I know this from customers, I know from yourself, and I'd say a lot of you are probably the same in here. Um, you bought a scope, six months later, you bought a bigger one, a year later, you bought a bigger one, and then your knees got a bit creaky in your 40s like me, and you went back down to a smaller one. Um, and that typically is what will happen. So the more you can future-proof this first purchase, the better. And the way of future-proofing it is generally to get the one that suits you the best. Um, so when you're narrowing it down, then probably the most important consideration is budget. Just set that budget, be it 500 quid, 1,000, 300. Obviously at 300, you don't have a lot of options. So it's really easy to pick one. Once you start hitting towards the 1,000, you've got a more than a dozen, maybe a dozen and a half scopes to realis realistically pick from. And then you just have to ask yourself um, some additional questions. Um, so for your typical beginner, your beginner, I'm gonna start with the kids first. So, the general feeling on it all is, and we get this obviously every day, we have tons of emails coming in, loads of calls coming in, buying telescopes for the under 10s. If your um, child is under 10 looking for a telescope, it's you that's going to become the astronomer, not them. If I have a nine-year-old at home. He might be able to find the moon with a really easy to use telescope. There's no hope if he was eight that he'd be able to do it or seven. And we have a six-year-old as well. She wouldn't be there. So the reality is if you're buying a scope for an under 10-year-old, it's for you. And you're going to have to learn how to use it and get them up to speed with it. Um, if you're buying for that age group, typically it depends on kind of what they're looking for or whether they're interested in astronomy. But very often, as the case is with them, looking at books or YouTube videos, it's probably going to have to be a tripod-mounted telescope. The tabletop Dobsonians, 
kind of don't really cut it for the visuals for them. Um, and obviously, as a lot of like experienced astronomers would know, the best telescope in the world is the one that you use the most. And it doesn't matter how big it is or expensive it is or cheap it is, if it's used the most, it's the best. So if you have a telescope there that in theory was the best one you could have bought for your budget size wise, and it's one of the tabletop Dobsonians and it's for a nine year old, it's probably not going to get used genuinely. Um, it would more than likely need to be tripod mounted, something like the one behind me here, the Astromaster 70, um, sub 200 quid, incredibly easy to use, simple to set up, takes a couple of minutes. And it's those kind of telescopes for that age group that you can grab, drag it out the back in less than 60 seconds, and you're looking at the moon, you know, 30 seconds later. Um, and that's where you get this usability from. If the telescope is not being used, it's a waste of money, essentially. So for that age group, it's probably going to have to be tripod mounted. And it needs to have the letters AZ in the title, not EQ. If it has AZ in the title, it's an Altaz, basically up, down, left, and right, out the back, point and shoot. Um, and that's kind of critical, even up to the age of like 15, 16, you probably want a telescope to have AZ in the title. And typically, for ease of use and maintenance and all of that, and durability, a refractor would be better than a reflector. Um, so you're talking about typically sub 200 quid. There's a number of refractors to pick from, and there's one or two reflectors on Altaz mounts that are also worth getting. Bear in mind, reflectors need a little bit more maintenance with regards to keeping the mirrors aligned um, and just being a little bit more fragile than a refractor. So that's what people telling you, oh, your reflectors are better than refractors. For that age group, sub 15, 16, they're probably not. A refractor is really what you need. Um, so typically something like an Astromaster 70, Astromaster 90, or an Evo Star 90, those kind of telescopes on tripods, on the Altaz mounts, are the ones that you should really be looking at. Once you start to come up in the years away from the, the kind of, you're into the mid-teens, 15, 16, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world to go straight for an EQ mount, but typically one of the equatorial mounts um, will have a larger scope on it, probably a 130 mil reflector or something like that. And again, bear in mind, at that age group, the budget's probably going to be maybe a little bit bigger. And because you're back to, you're not necessarily tied to the tripod mounted telescopes for that age group, the best bargain or best bang for a book that you can get would be with one of those tabletop Dobsonian telescopes, like the Heritage Range and Skywatcher. And like the Heritage 76 starts at 80 quid and they brought out, they go all the way up to 500 quid now, there's a Heritage 150, PX, which has a 150 mil mirror. Um, it's a floor mounted Dobsonian. It's about the height of your belly button when it's extended. And they're like 310. And then there's a go to version of that, which is probably the best value of them all at sub 500 because it's 489 and it's a six inch reflector with a go to mount operated from a smartphone or a tablet. So when you're into that age group, the project will probably have to be a little bit bigger. But they're more traditional with regards to try and get them the biggest scope you can, because at that age, if they're into astronomy, they're probably going to stick with it, which means you want to future proof the purchase as much as possible. So getting an Astromaster 90 or an Evo Star 90 at sub 300, if that's all the budget is, that'll do them perfect as well. Like I use Astromaster 90s at outreach events and the Evo Star 90 because they're, they give real good planetary views, real good lunar views, focal length like 900 mil, 1000 mil. So you get decent magnification from it. So they will also do that age group. But if you're shopping between, say, the 300 and the 500 range, try, if you can, tabletop Dobsonians, um, because they are amazing value for money. Um, once you move into the adults, and again, anything from a 90 mil refractor upwards will do an adult. The risk with a 70 mil or kind of if you're sub 200 quid um, shopping for an adult is that they'll grow out of it fairly quickly. If they're into the astronomy and they kind of have even a small interest in it, they'll throw an Astromaster 70 back after after four months. You know, oh, I've seen everything there is to see in that. I even bought more eyepieces, something better. So you're generally going to get a bigger scope anyway. Um, so with an adult then, this is where it really does um, blow out into there's a ton of scopes available and you know are more difficult to use than others but say you are shopping for an adult for christmas and you have say or you're shopping for yourself and you've given yourself 500 to a thousand to spend 
that's when it can start to get confusing and you get that whole rabbit hole thing because genuinely you have to kind of think about it a little bit more firstly because it's a lot of money and secondly because you want to get the telescope that does what you wanted to do so what i mean by that is i always kind of imagine it as if you get a meter ruler sitting in front of you and you have one and a hundred the planets and the moon are down here the deep sky stuff is up here and there is no telescope that does all of that equally well you can have one that's here here or here and you can reduce it this way a little bit or you can put a barrel i want it to go that way but essentially you can't do all of it and that's the key time and time again you know probably nine out of ten emails that come into us which always throw it in a bit of a curveball to me looking for a telescope they give the budget they give the user everything and then they go i want to see the moon and the planets and the stars and you're like yeah they're different telescopes essentially so you have to remember that. So often I start the conversation with an adult shopping at the 500 to 1,000, or even the 400 to 1,000, with what do you want to look at? And they kind of look at me with a bit of a blank look on their face, like, what do you mean what I want to look at? I'm like, do you want to look at the moon and the planets really, really well? The deep space, galaxies, star clusters, nebulas really, really well? Or do you want something that does both reasonably well? And generally, they'll probably plumb for the lunar planetary one or the all-rounder type scope. So then you've kind of narrowed it down to, okay, they really want to get their good views of the moon and planets in. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, you get such and such a scope. Then you decide to ask them, do they want the manually controlled scope or a go-to one? And then they kind of ask, like, what, what one is best? Well, it depends on the user again. So if you have somebody that has a ton of time in the evening, um, semi-retired, something like that, very patient, you might think about getting them a manual scope. And for your money, you'll get a bigger manual scope than the go-to. If they're severely short on time, they're impatient, um, or they just like results immediately, that kind of thing, you're probably better off getting the go-to scope. And that is where often we get um, people saying, okay, I want a go-to scope, but I don't want one that's difficult to use. They're all equally as difficult stroke, easy to use as each other. Because in the end of the day, you have to align two or three bright stars whether it's with a hand controller one, with one of the ones that's operated from an app, and there's no getting away from that. There's only one way of getting away from that's by spending, you know, 400 quid odd on a star sense auto align from Celestron, but that's not necessary. Um, the alignment procedure has to be done, and there's no way around it, either one star, two star, three star. So once you get into these go-to scopes, basically they're all as easy or as difficult to use, depending on your perception of it, as each other. And it's just about picking the one that's best for you and the situation that you're in. So typically, if you're one of the more traditional guys like me, you'd go with a hand controller or operate go-to telescope. If you're a newer techie type person, you might go with the app control ones. Certainly, if you have a family of people or there's more than one person going to be out at the telescope at a time, definitely have a look at one of the app control telescopes. Because what will happen is, once you get your alignment done, you'll have one person operating the app picking the object while one is looking at an object and then the other person can be reading out information about the object, which is especially good for the newcomers. Basically, when you're looking at an object, you can press info on the app, brings up all the information about the object, how far away it is, what it is and all of that. And then you can go back into Night Sky Tour, choose another object and away it goes. So when you have an app operated, one from a tablet or a smartphone, and you have a family of people or more than one, it generally tends to be a little bit more involved to use and keeps everybody that little bit more interested. So definitely families should be looking at the app operated ones, which are the GTI range from Skywatcher or the Astrophy and Evolution range from Celestron. And um, if you're more traditional like me and you want to get the hand controller ones, you don't want to have to have the, the effort of a phone and making sure it's charged and all that stuff or just operating from an app. The hand controller ones that we've all used for 20 odd years now are just as good. Um, you just need to get used to the menus that are in there. So you might have a couple of clicks of menu buttons in order to find an object rather than just tapping the screen on a phone. And again, just like the other one, you'll need to do a one, two or three star alignment in order to get the thing aligned. Um, and that's keeping everything simple for observing kind of 500 to 1000. You're looking at the Astrophy range, the GTI range, the evolution or the evolution's over a grand. Then when you're looking at the hand controller ones, you're looking at the SLT range from Celestron and the SynScan AZ go-to range from Skywatcher. So which one you would pick of all of them? Basically, the mounts are all the same. So when you see the SLT range in Celestron or the Astrophy range or the, uh, 
uh, Sin Scan range and Skywatcher or Pods and Mount, all identical. So all operate the same as each other. You'll just notice that there's different telescopes on them, maybe three or four different telescopes. One will be a Maxitov Cassegrain, one of them will probably be a Schmidt Cassegrain, one will be a reflector, and one will be a refractor, typically a short tube refractor. Which telescope you pick then largely depends on what you want to really kind of look at. So if you wanted a catch-all solution, which I often get asked, can you give me a telescope that does the planets and the moon really well? But when I want to do the deep sky, you can give me something that makes it a little more deep sky. Straight away, you're looking at Schmidt Cassegrain, something like that, or a Maxitov Cassegrain that you can then get a reducer for and reduce it back. That would be the best all around, quite expensive way of doing it. If you wanted one that you just wanted to do your planets in the moon and you weren't really all that interested in the deep sky, you'd get a, a Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, if you only wanted to do planets in deep sky and you know you had no interest whatsoever in deep space at all, you'd have a look at a Maxitov Cassegrain, which is even further up the magnification than a Schmidt Cassegrain, and not all of them will take a reducer to reduce it back. So you have to be very careful. Anytime anybody pretty much gets onto the website and buys a Maxitov Cassegrain scope without first kind of being in contact with me, generally gets a call or an email asking them, how did you arrive at that one? Did you know that that's a planetary scope? And you try to kind of often have to swap it over for something else because they just bought based on budget. So the catch all of all of them would be a 127 SLT or um, SINSCAN from Skywatcher with uh, a reducer. And that will do your planets and moon really well. And when the time comes to reduce it, you put the reducer on the back and you're back to the deep sky scope then and get your better views of the deep sky. The all round scope to buy without having to buy any additional, um, without having to buy any additional adapters or anything would more would be more like the 130 mil reflector. So your 130Ps, like there's millions of them out there, all on different mounts. It's basically if it has a parabolic mirror and it's a 130P with a focal length of about 650 mil, it's the same mirror set on every single mount. So the view is going to be the same. And that would be your more all-rounder deep sky scope that with the addition of a high pair of eyepiece will get you somewhat towards the planetary, but nowhere near as good as a Schmidt Cassegrain would have done for you. Um, it's a bit more of an all-rounder at a cheaper price, typically about 550 quid will get you a go-to one. Um, and that will get you into an all-rounder scope, keep you pretty happy for a good while and get you kind of into astronomy then. And, very often it could well be a scope for like, you know, 550 quid is a lot of money. Um, it's a 130 mil scope at the end of the day, five inch. So it often does people, you know, for it. Um, so the other thing to consider then, it's not just the budget and kind of what you want to look at as well, it's portability. Um, we often get people in looking to stow them away in campers, caravans, that kind of thing for when they go away. So often that can be a, um, a deciding factor in whether or not a particular scope is for you or not. Um, so the main things to look for are your budget, your portability, and who you're buying it for. That's absolutely critical. It's the age of the person that you're buying it for. It's the even the ability of them to lift large or bulky items. Um, it's their patience level. It's their time management level, like how much time do they have to spend and stuff like that. So all of these are incredibly important. And um, the other thing to watch out for as well is, and you often know all about this before you even get the telescope, and it is the expectations, okay? Um, over the years, like we've sent out probably tens of thousands of telescopes at this stage. I think I've had two returns. One of them was this year. Um, a guy waited and waited and waited to get a SkyMax 127. And the day I got it in, he legged it up to the shop, brought it home. And the next day he's like, can you take that back? And I'm like, yeah, sure. What's wrong with it? It's not really showing me the views I wanted. And I'm like, what views did you really want? And he kind of said, in a Skymax 127, which is like I don't know, 650 quid, he expected Jupiter to look like this, which I'm sure you're all probably laughing going, it doesn't look like that at all. Um, if anything, it kind of looked like the little dot down this end. Um, so that's an expectation thing. So you have to temper your expectations. The shots that you see 
the still shots that you would see on Facebook and that, they're, as we all know, highly processed. Um, doesn't matter what telescope it's with, generally cropped, bigger than it would look like to the naked eye. So you have to watch out for that as well. And a lot of people are surprised to find that, you know, a couple of Tom O'Donoghue shots in here, the Orion Nebula and that, that they aren't going to see exactly that when they look at the object. And to run left at Orion, the book is brilliant for showing people, you know, no, it looks like this, it looks like pencils against a black background sky. So it's always about tempering their expectations. And um, so you always have to be wary of that. The best way to kind of get them into it is to get them looking at the moon first. The moon is deadly in any telescope, pretty much any telescope, I'm sure we'd all agree. Um, so that's often when you're kicking somebody off that has got a telescope, you set it up during the day, obviously pointing away from the sun. You focus on a distant object to get used to focusing and switching your eyepiece. And you're going to make life easier for yourself then when you actually go out at night. And then when you go out at night, then you go straight for the moon if it's up. Hopefully it is. If it's not, you go for any other object that you can see with the naked eye. And that will make your life easier too. And this all leads into the original thing that I said. If they're enjoying this and they're all excited looking at the moon and it's, you know, it's pretty interesting and you maybe you drag up a moon map on Google or something or you have a moon map in one of the books, you can start looking for stuff on it. And that's where the engagement comes that keeps them using the telescope and wanting to go out using it. And then your money has no waste on the scope that hasn't been used. So that's where it goes back to the beginning, which is the whole experience level of the person who wants it and whether or not they really want it tempered with how much money you really want to spend on the scope for them. So again, if you have that younger um, sub 10 year old group, it's going to be you that's finding all the objects. It's going to be you that's giving them the wow factor and showing them Jupiter and showing them cloud bands and moons and the rings of Saturn and all of that. That's all going to be down to you. And even find them the easier deep sky stuff like the Seven Sisters, um, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, all those easier targets, um, Miser and Alpha, the double star. Um, this is all going to be up to you in order to get the scope being used. So you've got to remember that when you're buying it for somebody who's under maybe 10, that it is going to be you. So don't be kind of rolling your eyes to heaven on find out that telescope again. You know, you're going to have to. And then when they get older, then they'll be able to use it themselves. And that's when you'll typically be shopping probably for a bigger one, which is what would have happened to me when I was the first telescope. By the time I was 11, the second one arrived, 12, the third arrived, and then I got a paper round to buy like an eight inch job. Back in the early nineties, I think it was, cost a fortune. Like, um, but that's what we did in order to get our scope. And obviously a lot of us would have gone bigger and bigger and bigger. I went all the way up to a 16 inch job and then all the way back down to an eight inch. Um, and that's to do with, dragon scopes in and out and all of that and you realize you just don't have the time to be hauling in like 16 inch dobs or stuff like that but it's great getting up to that and seeing the views that were in that and then coming back down um so the other one then is your equatorial mounts so all the scopes i've spoken about so far are all for observing so they're brilliant for going outside having a look at some stuff maybe taking a couple of quick smartphone shots of jupiter saturn that kind of thing um, and they're all brilliant for that when you get the photography thing thrown in, and it often does get thrown into plenty of emails and inquiries that we get, you're kind of walking down an entirely different road. So if you have somebody in the family, and we only had like a, there was a 16 year old lad in here with his dad there last Friday, and he, he wanted to do, but he knew what he wanted. He wanted to do deep sky photography. He borrowed his mom's DSLR, and we managed to find a setup for him. So when photography is involved, in particular deep sky photography, you're going to have to get an equatorial mount and ideally one that has go to to make your life a little easier. Um, and then you're really kind of in the beginning, you're probably trying to avoid getting Schmidt Cassegrains, Maxidov Cassegrains, that kind of thing. And you're looking for a shorter focal length reflector or refractor. Um, typically, hopefully with a dual speed focuser to make life a, bit, a little bit easier for you and one that will definitely focus with a camera. Because if you look at a load of telescopes on the websites and you see 130p or 150p or even the 200p and it doesn't have any other letters after it, there's a very small chance, unless it's a Skywatcher one, that it won't focus with a DSLR camera. So you have to be very careful. That's why Skywatcher brought out the PDS range, which has the dual speed focuser. They shorten the scope to push the focal point out of the eyepiece or out of the focuser a little bit more in order to make it focus. 
So you can get caught a couple of times at 130Ps, 150Ps, not being able to focus. So be very careful of that. So typically, your budget as photography setup, if somebody was looking for astro photography as a beginner, would be an EQ3 Pro, a 130 PDS reflector, and a power supply. And you're talking in or around a thousand euro for that. If you want to go to equatorial mount, there's you can't get away with like five, six hundred quid. You just can't. Um, the 130 PDS would be the smallest, cheapest scope that would be good for photography, and the EQ3 Pro would be the smallest, lightest mount that has a go-to system. Um, and that's typically like I think we we've three sets of them going out now, went out this week and being collected this week, and they literally just rocked in saying thousand euros spent. I want to do astrophotography, deep sky, here you go, that's what you get. When you up the budget then, you're just basically upping the payload of the mount to get a bigger scope. And within reason then, you have to temper that with the follow-up questions where you're kind of qualifying people for it. Do you want to do observing and photography? Because if you do, you do want that kind of bigger scope, 130 mil reflector, 150 mil reflector. But if they only wanted to do photography and genuinely they weren't interested in observing, an 80 mil doublet refractor would be absolutely perfect. Uh, it's what I use myself for a lot of the photography I do. On an EQ3 Pro mount is in around a 750 mark for the scope, something like that. And you're talking 620 for the mount and then a power supply, which is typically for a wall mount, the power supply about 70 quid. So that would be the ideal photography setup if you wanted to do deep sky. Um, because it is quite tricky. It's a very, very steep learning curve. Even if you know photography, astrophotography is quite a steep learning curve and then as we all know a lot of us in here would already know that the it's not all about the taking of the picture it's the processing that comes afterwards then which i put my hands up straight away and say i just don't have a huge amount of time to do the processing so i tend to send all my files to dave connolly who was a, a previous mac member and he would often process mine and send them back and i'd be just blown away with what he got compared to what i got so there is an art in the processing end of it. Um, it's definitely something that needs to be learned if you want to get the best out of the data sets that you collect. But as a beginner, typically to do photography deep sky, you're going to need your own DSLR, an equatorial go-to mount, and a cost-efficient telescope that will focus with a DSLR. And typically the 130 PDS would be in or around that. To do your planetary photography then, um, that's slightly easier with regards to the telescope that you need, because basically it becomes an easy job with any tracking telescope whatsoever. Um, typically you'll pick up a planetary camera for about 200 quid, a ZWO and a 120, either color or mono, and you would attach that to your telescope. No matter what the telescope is, you can use a two by barrel, some lads even use five by barrels in order to get like the most zoomed in image that they can. And then you do what's basically a video. So you take a one minute video, you import it into a free program called Auto Stackard. It slices it up into whatever amount of frames it is, maybe 600 of them. You tell it to keep a certain percentage of them that are really, really clear. It dumps the rest and it stacks them up and gives you an end image that you then bring into Registax and do what I call the John McLean specials and try to get the shots like I put there, showed you there a second ago, which are his shots. So the planetary photography is doable with one of the observing setups I mentioned from earlier. Any sort of a tracking mount in or around the kind of 450 range upwards will get you into the planetary imaging. Um, you could also, in theory, take individual single shots of the planets, but that will be a bit more hit and miss with regards to which of the clear ones, the clear shots you do get. So the other thing then is what happens after you get the scope. So when you get the scope and they're out using it, typically after a couple of uses, hopefully they're familiar with it then and they know how to use it and they know how to align it and all of that. The additional question you get then is, hopefully it's not, uh, I need a better telescope or I need a bigger telescope. Hopefully it's something along the lines of, can I get a better view? Which often nine times out of 10 means that they're looking for a higher magnification eyepiece. If they want better views or bigger views as they'll say, the planets and the moon, or a lot rarer this one, they'll actually ask for a lower powered eyepiece in order to get some brighter, deep sky views of the deep sky field. So often a follow on purchase or sometimes ones that are bought when the telescope is being bought would be a high powered eyepiece. And I often get asked about Barlow's and um, you get people just rocking into the shop going, yeah, remember I got that scope off you two weeks ago or three weeks ago, or whatever. I've been told I need a Barlow lens. Absolutely, you don't need a Barlow lens. And um, generally I advise 
whatever the scope it is that you have, pick up the highest single eyepiece that gives you the highest magnification for that particular scope. So say if you had a 130 mil reflector, you'll go about as low as a five mil eyepiece. Get the five mil eyepiece, and then you know the highest magnification I can get on any given night is with this eyepiece. You're not achieving it with a Barlow and a 10 mil, which is a lot of glass between you and the object. If you had, depending on the size of Schmidt Passagrain, you might only go as low as a seven mil, that kind of thing. So that's a common follow-up purchase is the highest single high parallel eyepiece I can get. And often then you get the questions about the filters. A moon filter can be handy for um, doling down the moon. We all know, kind of most of us in here as astronomers and know the full moon is not really the best time to look at the moon. Um, most beginners wait for it to be full, fire the telescope out and then get dazzled. Um, so they'll often be on looking for a moon filter. And then the other kind of additional purchase that's often a very handy one at the beginning is a good book, especially if they're readers. Um, the reason being it keeps them happy when it's cloudy. They can be leafing through the book and maybe planning what they're going to look at the next time and all of that. And again, this all ties into keeping them interested and keeping them using it. Um, and then typically a, a good book for, say, the kind of 8 to 13, 14-year-old would be a walk through the heavens, which covers the night sky plus a bit more of the kind of legends behind why constellations got their names, which is all very interesting. If you had somebody, say, over the age of 14 or 15, you really can't do any better than Turn Left at Orion. Um, it is a class book. I'd say most that are in the chat here either have it or know someone that has it. Um, deals with how to use your telescope at the start, covers some really brilliant moon maps at the beginning, goes through the planets, and then just goes through all the good deep sky objects, one page at a time, telling you how to find it and giving you, crucially, your expectation of what it looks like. Um, it really is one of the best books out there. We, I think I only have one copy left there at the moment, but I think there's 50 left um, the book place there the other day. So I'm expecting a lot more back in stock. So it should, if it's out of stock on the website, it should be back up soon. Um, that is, without doubt, the best book you can get as a young adult or an adult um, getting into astronomy and keeping it kind of simple as well with regards to your observing um, and should keep people using their telescopes that a little bit more. Um, so that about covers it. So it can be confusing, but it isn't really. It's all down to the budget. Sub 300, you've got a choice of maybe five or six telescopes to pick from. It doesn't matter where you get it from. That's really much your choice. You're looking for AZ in the title in order to make it easy and preferably a refractor. The next age group up into the mid-teens, you could probably just be safe in getting the biggest scope you can get for your budget, something like a Heritage um, Tabletop or a Dobsonian, something like that Skyliner. will keep them happy for ages. Once you hit the 500 quid mark, it complicates a little bit more with the go-to scopes. Families, couples, I recommend you get the app operations because they're just a bit more, and the interface is just a bit more multi-user friendly. Um, and then which scope you get. If you really want to look at the planets on the moon, get one of the Cassegrain type scopes, either Mac or Schmidt. And if you want more of an all-rounder, stick to the 130 mil reflectors, 150 mil reflectors, and the 102 mil short refractors. Um, so that would be my real simple advice on how to narrow it down. Um, I suppose we'll ask the best way of kind of teasing all this out, see if anybody has any questions. And um, hopefully we have a couple of beginners here who have questions or somebody pretend to be a beginner and ask me a question. And I'll, if I don't know the answer, like I said to Jason, I'll just make it up. So <laughs> it'd be grand. Do you want to take over again there, Jason? Are you off watching the match? Uh, no, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know what score it is. <laughs> oh, do you not? Probably no. 18 nil to Ireland. Yeah, right. Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nil all till the land 90th minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, anybody got any questions there, guys? If you want to unmute. Yeah, 